Welcome to another discussion with Claire. My name is Sasha Zalesnik. I'm the physician here with, with Dr. Chaudhry. Yeah, my name is Sabda Chaudhry. I'm a psychiatrist um, uh, and also have other subspecialties, which is addiction psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and geriatric psychiatry are some of the areas that I have previously had the interest in and in the practice in. Uh, uh, so I'm very glad to be here with Sasha to talk about some of these interesting things that we offer at our, at our center. Seclair offers multiple level of psychiatric interventions, including allopathic sciences, which include medicines, uh, which are often very necessary for initial treatments, uh, for depression and mood disorders uh, outside of that and uh, various other conditions including substance abuse disorders. Uh, we also offer urgent treatment to augment the treatment care and outcomes uh, which includes uh, um, uh, practices of mindfulness, uh, understanding our nutritional health and really kind of encompassing some very simple knowledges uh, to improve our mental health and well-being. No, I agree and I think Seclair is unique in that it offers therapists in the same location as the psychiatrists and we also do the dialectical behavioral therapy groups and so it really can offer patients medication if necessary, a counselor, and then the group skills classes in addition to a whole mind-body health approach even the nutrition and things like that that you mentioned in the alternative medicines because people really do need tailored care for the individual especially in psychiatry it's not black and white very true um, so we have fun treating people and we have fun learning and understanding their conditions and really re-empowering them with knowledge of sometimes conditions that can be very uh, stigmatizing. Um, often people come in uh, with, oh, I have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I was in a hospital, and I feel less of a person and are ashamed and are feeling fearful of this condition. We actually use those conditions to re empower ourselves with knowledge and understanding. Uh, a lot of our time is spent helping people understand their disorders, but also understanding their strengths and really kind of finding a unique blend of their strengths as the primary driver uh, to reach out to their condition and have fun with it and enjoy them and understand it better, uh, not only for themselves but for their families and loved ones. So I think the different experience of Seclair starts as soon as you walk in the door. Typically, people have a preconceived notion of what a psychiatric practice should look like, and you know they will often think of people that are scary sitting in the waiting room and white coats and very stark walls, but that isn't the case at all here. I mean, it's more like a family approach, and people walk in and feel comfortable, and they tell me that again and again when I see new patients that they don't feel like they're coming here because they have a problem. but they're coming here because there are comfort and support and good care. Uh, that is true. As a psychiatrist for the past 25 plus years, I came to realize that um, when a person is diagnosed with a mood disorder or a psychiatric condition or a substance abuse disorder, it really is very difficult for the whole system of care. Um, and thus, there's a fear, there's an unknown, and there's a fear of losing the quality of life. Um, uh, and we, in our modern times, pay very little attention to psychiatric disorders. Uh, I realize that we have to kind of take a different approach, and an approach of understanding that a person who's coming in with a lot of fears needs to be heard, needs to be understood, and also they oftentimes feel at the very low point in their life. Uh, when if you're depressed, you don't even feel like getting up and taking a shower, what we take for granted on an everyday basis. Uh, so we understand how difficult and traumatizing uh, and challenging these disorders can be. Uh, so we, we created an environment where we accept 
and understand and hear uh, their challenges uh, and, and understanding where they're at and meet them where they're at in their life uh, and help them work through and navigate through the difficulties of medical psychiatric barriers to, to which their quality of life is being affected. Uh, and and our, our results have been very rewarding. Uh, when people get well and re-empowered, they stay well. They're not in and out of the hospitals. Our readmission rates are very, very low and our engagement and treatment is very high. Uh, so we are very, very uh, satisfied as clinician to offer the blend of care that works very well for people in their unique difficulties. No, and I totally agree with that. And we get to work with people individually and really get to know them. We don't trade people quite frequently unless it's by request. We really get to know them and hear them, like you went, mentioned. It's not just an in and out visit. They really get to say what they're feeling because that can mean the difference. Even if the medication is same as another practice, that extra step of like a provider or patient relationship can help people really flourish. Absolutely. I remember <clears throat> when I was a resident, uh, my attendings knew the families and the patients uh, not only the person who was in treatment, but also their mothers and grandparents and their children. And they rarely had to actually read up a medical record because they knew the family. Mm -hmm. uh, and the modern healthcare system is so broken that you may be seeing a different doctor at a, at a different visit. And thus the continuity of care is not as consistent. And thus we have tried to foster the capacity to have more individualized, consistent care uh, over time obviously over the lifespan that we have and mm -hmm. we, we try to match people's needs consistently. And we also include the families which is from what I'm hearing from a lot of patients kind of rare in a lot of other places. They might say okay you can go see a family therapist to have the family involved versus even in the psychiatric mm -hmm. and we often bring people in to help learn to support their their family member that's struggling or help that family me member better, you know, unify with their unit of support system, so. So because each person is grounded and rooted in their family system and families often don't know how to support and what to do and what not to do. Uh, so we give them techniques, knowledges and practices that they can be better uh, suited for their needs of their loved ones. Almost like doing a CPR for somebody with a heart problem. Mm -hmm. So we teach people psychiatric CPRs. Yeah, exactly. And advanced cardiac life support if needed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to sum it all up is we really do pay attention to what our patients and our patient population needs and try to enhance the practice to offer those things. And we love doing it. Mm -hmm. So the most common psychiatric conditions are mood disorders, which includes depression, bipolar disorder, and then sub subclasses of the same, like cyclothymias and bipolar II and um, long-term depressions and dysthymias. Uh, a lot of anxiety disorders, um, which manifest themselves as either social anxiety, panic disorders, generalized anxiety disorders. Uh, we also treat people actually a large number of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, often post-traumatic stress disorder is linked to wars and veterans, post-traumatic stress uh, and or sexual abuse issues. It really is much more broader than that. Even witnessed trauma can be huge. Um, and so there are various aspects of traumas that manifest themselves in in the, in the shape and form of even addictions and our eating disorders and our um, mood disorders and so forth. Um, so we treat other conditions such as obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, schizophrenia, uh, schizoaffective disorder, um, and um, um, some eating disorders uh, fall into uh, treatment as well. Uh, so these are the most common conditions. And then we also treat people with uh, suboxone for those who may have narcotic dependence and or other ways to help them. 
uh, given the epidemic of uh, pain, disorder, uh, pain medicine and or narcotic dependence, uh, we have a unique program to offer uh, treatment which will last for longer time. Uh, in, in addition, adjustment disorders and marital difficulties and challenges within relationships and so forth. So we offer a wide variety of psychiatric treatments encompassing um, the usual adult psychiatry treatments uh, as well as addiction related care. So our addiction program, we wanted to highlight a little bit because in often scenarios, people think of coming and getting medication, whether that be Suboxone, and then just going on their way, and they don't really know how to change the patterns of behavior their addiction has created. They just are wanting to get off the substance. And often that really isn't enough for people. So our program is not just medication for the rest of your life, here you go. It provides people with a counselor, with some, some group information to really build a good support system, a knowledge base to manage their addictive mindset behaviors and give them even family involvement for the best chance at staying sober permanently. Absolutely. Uh, so there are not very many facilities where they provide dual psychiatric care and treatment for addictions. Often. Uh, in the systems, either you are seeing a psychiatrist for addiction, uh, psychiatric care or an addictionologist. Fortunately, we offer both of those treatments right in one, one place, uh, and thus enhancing and really reducing people's times of running around in two different locations, and really kind of integrating them in a very seamless manner. Um, and so, as Sasha indicated earlier, um, uh, treatments for addiction is not just detox, uh, detox is just just getting ourselves off of that substance. The real treatment is treatment of what caused a person to start using drugs and or alcohol or any other chemical, uh, cocaine or amphetamines and or you know, all these new designer drugs. And then we try to understand is there a mood disorder that needs to be taken care of and often when you take care of why people use then they don't have a need to use. No, that's exactly true, and it's so helpful that we have that psychiatric foundation for the addiction program because they often do go hand in hand. And I think even when other doctors might start with prescribing narcotics, they just don't have the time to spend with the people to rule out all possible psychiatric conditions that might eventually lead this person to developing an addiction from you know, an initial prescription for legitimate pain. So once the person's in that role that they've developed an addiction, doctors sometimes don't even know how to handle that or where to send them. So coming to a psychiatric practice might be an opportunity because they're going to get their addiction dealt with, but then also look a little bit deeper. Absolutely. And I want to kind of add, that's very well said, in our modern day times, our family doctors and internists really don't have much time to spend uh, given the magnitude of their responsibilities. And so thus, psychiatry is the only field where we have the time. All we do is listen and hear and understand. Uh, so we're very, we, we work with uh, local clinicians who have that interest of uh, collaboration to actually give them that time and understanding for their patients who then are not presenting to emergency rooms or medical settings with somatic symptoms, mm -hmm. which may have a psychiatric underpinnings. Mm -hmm. And we collaborate and we make sure that our primary care colleagues are aware of how we, what are we doing and how are we treating them. Yeah, always. DBT uh, is a term coined by Marsha Linehan for dialectic behavioral therapy. Many of us would be aware of behavioral therapies. That means how to change behavior. Understanding cognition means our thoughts, how to change our thoughts, because if my thoughts are negative, my behavior would be negative as well. Uh, so if I'm feeling very irritable and agitated and feeling that I don't matter, that I've been abandoned and I don't, nobody cares, then my behavior is going to be 
manifested in the similar manner. Uh, if I'm traumatized, I will have the trauma out my mind and thus that will keep me awake at night and will keep me behaving in a manner which is not prudent, like drinking alcohol or, or shopping or gambling and so forth. So we understand the cognition, which is the thinking of the brain, and then it makes it easier to understand why we behave the way we behave. Um, so if somebody has a thought of feeling hungry, it means they are going to look for food. If I'm feeling thirsty, I will look for water. Now, if you and I know that many a time you're not hungry and still we are eating, now that is called mindless eating. Uh, that means we may be feeding our emotional states. Uh, I have done that many, many times myself and I'm eating something and I don't even have a reason to eat anymore. So we use the term mindfulness, that means becoming aware of why our thoughts are the way they are. And that is the added component to DBT which says you learn your mental health by understanding your inner emotional psychology and emotional intelligence and by understanding where, where, how many thoughts we have and are some of those thoughts redundant and not necessary and some of those thoughts maybe are important and helpful. It's almost like cleaning my, my, my clothing cupboard. Sometimes I have 20 pants hanging and I only need two of them. So sometimes we have about one million thoughts in our brain and we only need 20 of them. <laughs> so mindfulness allows us to understand how our brain can be cluttered by unnecessary clutter and thoughts and how to clean it up. So we call it DBT. It's a fancy term for understanding our own brain and understanding our thought patterns and understanding which one are helpful and which one we need to just redo and, and then upgrade to a new software of the brain. Yeah, and DBT and mindfulness is a little bit different because when we think of like cognitive behavioral therapy or psychotherapy, we might think of you know delving way back in the past and you know correlating something that happened a long time ago with with something that's happening now, or it might look at one specific behavior that needs to change. But in developing mindfulness, it gives you the full spectrum picture. It gives you the past and how that's affecting you now. And it also gives you that insight into how your brain is working currently so that you can make changes. And a lot of our classes are DBT skill format. So it's not only recognizing where you're at currently, but things that you can do to make subtle improvements to that with real skills. So that when you feel completely helpless, you aren't left with just this pill that you know you take and hope to God that it works. You can say, I know that I have something that I myself can do, and that's what empowerment is. Absolutely, absolutely. So that was one of my own realization as a psychiatrist that we used to tell people, go get a job, go get a life, go get better. And, and yes, of course, everybody wants to get better, uh, and they want to have a life, but many a times it's not as easy as it seems, and we would call them non-compliant with treatment, or they don't want to get better, or they're stuck. However, on the contrary, it's almost like asking somebody to go out and read a manual for how to fly a plane and saying, now that you read the manual, go ahead, fly a plane. You should know it all. Uh, flying a plane or driving a car not only requires how to read a book, but also step-by-step -step instructions of how to do it just right. And in psychiatry, we often have missed that thing in our clinical practices. So our our, our our skills groups are actually practicing sessions where we actually tell people and teach people how to dance life rather than feeling miserable in life. And, 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 and we have a lot more engagement because people want to get better, sometimes they don't know how to get better. And, and thus, we teach them exactly what to do and how to do that, if that's their choice. And just to even bring that back in from what makes us individual, I think that this practice is cool because you are involved in a lot of the groups as well as myself, so it's not just us saying, you need to go to this group, it's 
we're involved in the whole patient's care. We really do get to know them. Absolutely. I want to kind of add, um, we, we must live that life ourselves or else we cannot help another person to get better. Uh, so we do, as clinicians, all of our clinicians do mindfulness practices. We try to eat healthy, we sleep on time, and we understand the life forces at play, the financial health issues, the issues pertaining to relationship issues, and the fears which are at this time dominating the earth, you know, the wars and the and, and challenges, you know, shooting and whatnot that we, in the middle of all that chaos, we have to stay very mindful and grounded so that we can address those and live not in fears but in wisdom. And, and, the, and the practice really is the exact opposite of fear which dominates the earth at this time and, and, and drives people's behaviors. We like to drive behaviors by, by mindfulness uh, practices. So, we wanted to bring this up because the reality is mental health is very real and people even that feel that they're functioning very well could still be struggling with depressions, anxiety that nobody really sees. And we are a part of the community, just like you were saying at the end of our last question, as much as our patients. So we really want to display that there are other options out there for them. And so in the community, there are all these things like, you know, anti-gun, anti-drug. And yes, I mean, that's very important, but people generally know not to go out and shoot somebody or to take drugs. But what we're interested in is what takes them from that step of knowing not to and actually doing it because so many people do. It's an epidemic. And usually that's, that's mental health or personal struggles that people don't feel comfortable or don't know where to turn to get help with before that. So it's not only about educating patients and providing that safe space for them to get better, but also for the community teaching people how to recognize mental health so that you know a doctor or a family member can see someone struggling and offer them a resource. Absolutely. Our, we have our healthcare system exactly opposite of how it could possibly be. Rather than tertiary intervention, which is when a person is actually ill, we want to make sure that a person sh is likely to stay healthy. Uh, so rather than us having insurance cards which ensure our getting into a hospital, we like to make sure that a person stays well uh, and, 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 and stays healthy. And as Sasha was indicating, uh, nobody wants to feel miserable and terrible and depressed and sad, but sometimes people don't know how not to uh, and what circumstances can lead them to feeling very badly about their life circumstances. Uh, and I'll give an example. I saw someone who was 14 years of age, and when I asked her a question, what brings you here? She said, I don't fit in. Uh, and and it almost broke my heart uh, because she had some autism spectrum disorder condition. That does not mean that she does not fit in. She does fit in in a different way of strengths. Uh, so rather than, and she was very actively suicidal when she came in, and now she's actually thriving uh, in her wisdom in the area of which where God has gifted her. Uh, so we look for people's strengths rather than difficulties. And and so we are, we are a, a bearer of good news rather than the bad news. So if you want to hear the good news, come join us and find your health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So I think the reasoning behind this is to kind of communicate to people in the community, other providers, what we offer here. More so than this being a commercial for sending lots of patients. It's more of just an outreach because we realize a lot of people don't know about this resource as much as they maybe should in the community because we really do see people get better and I'll often hear from patients, I didn't even know this was here. And so this is gonna be the change. <laughs> I wanna bring in something so that I can show that. <laughs> they just caught my eye. And 
So we want to let people know that if you're looking at a Mountain Dew, the Mountain Dew is not found in this bottle. This is a name which has 77 grams of sugar in that. Uh, so, and these are the kind of things we teach people that for Mountain Dew you have to go to a real mountain and not to a 7-Eleven. And if you're looking for a vitamin water, this vitamin water has, by the way, 32 grams of sugar in that. Um, and thus, I can go on to other things. And, and the point we are trying to make is that we are trying to, oh, this one is my favorite one, the ocean spray. So you really would not find an ocean spray in the bottle. It's the sugar spray. And so thus be very, very, very aware of that. And really the point we are trying to say, you know, that by doing some simple things in our life, we can really kind of regain uh, a lot of health. Uh, like a tree, tree does not need a lot of medicines. It needs water, it needs air, it needs some sunshine and roots and some nutrition and a tree is a happy tree. So human beings are no different than a tree except that we are walking trees. Uh, I have never seen a tree drinking ocean spray. So on that note, we are just allowing ourselves to know how to make informed choices which make sense to people and reclaim and regain their health and well-being. So it's like that return of we don't want people to be referred somewhere or to be showing up some, somewhere based out of fear. It's more out of wisdom and knowledge and even if we have to teach them that along the way, that's part of the fun. <laughs> and if you want to ride horses, um, me and Sasha, Sasha is a pro in horses <laughs> and I'm learning how to ride horses. So sometimes riding the life horse is a very complex thing, it throws us off. But we will teach you how to like, ride your own horse of life. If your emotion is throwing you off and the horse of the brain is bucking, maybe it needs a little, little training and retraining. Uh, so actually just as a horse training you know, uh, center, we call it a psychiatric center. <laughs>